Yes, so let's start. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar titled The Standard Development Process to Address the Concerns for RFI Chaos Degradation to Remote Active and Passive Sensors. I will be your host today. My name is Raul Diez. I am uh, co-chair co of the Frequency Allocation in Remote Sensing Technical Committee of the GRSS. I'm glad to have uh, with us today, uh, our speaker, Paul Bacchus. He He's an experienced spectrum manager with over 35 years of experience in this in this field. Now he's with um, the John Hopkins University, specifically with the Applied Physics Laboratory. He's supporting NOAA and Department of Defense on, on Spectrum Management Matters. Please, uh, during this webinar, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat or in the question and answers box. After the talk, we, we can go through them and, and try to, to answer them. So, Bo, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so very much, Rod. Thank you. And um, it's great to get a chance to, to talk about one of my favorite subjects, uh, active and passive sensors in space. Um, I'd like to start off with, um, uh, let's see, there we go. I'm having trouble with advancing. So there we go, got it. Um, like to start off a little bit with an introduction on the uh, nature of the problem. And that is, is, is what we call radio frequency interference. So spaceborne microwave remote sensing instruments, which are essential for both weather and climate monitoring, um, have a potential to be interfered with. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, how that works here in a couple slides. But to start off with, active sensors um, or active instruments and passive instruments, these are the two natures of, of remote sensing. Um, the active ones transmit a signal and measure what's scattering back to the Earth. Basically, they transmit and they receive. Um, and then passive instruments are basically, they capture the radiation that's emitted in uh, in a natural form from the Earth. So these instruments, they operate at very specific frequencies. These frequencies are basically geophysical characteristics uh, of the Earth's surface and atmosphere. And, and because they are, are, are physically defined, um, the uh, International Telecommunications Union has established in their radio regulations uh, protected bands that are set so that the passive and active sensors can work without uh, interference or are supposed to work without interference. Um, passive sensors um, uh, are typically the uh, exclusive users of these bands, but uh, one of the natures of interference is, is that uh, it can uh, come in from the adjacent bands and come in and cause interference to, uh, uh, to the passive bands or, uh, and I'll get into that again a little bit more about uh, how that works uh, active sensors, uh, they typically share frequency bands with other services, such as uh, uh, um, Earth uh, uh, observing, um, uh, Earth observing uh, uh, satellite uh, service, and so forth, um, EESS, and um, and and on. Um, so, with this possibility, one of the important things that we started looking at is how do we start to designing sensors in a growingly and increasingly uh, congested environment um, with, uh, and, and by environment, I mean a radio frequency environment, how do we get these um, sensors to be a little bit more robust? And we'll go into that. So, um, so let's start off with uh, a little bit about what is uh, microwave remote sensing. And microwave remote sensing basically comes from the idea that every physical body, the water, soil, basically everything on Earth um, emits electromagnetic radiation. And this energy can be measured in space by microwave sounders or radiometers. The amount of energy is very weak. And, um, and if you look at it, it's uh, measured in, in tenths of a picowatt. And that extreme sensitivity is what makes it particularly um, uh, vulnerable and it makes it that much more essential to maintain the protected allocations. So that said, what are we talking about when we say radio frequency interference? 
the um, radio frequency interference, first of all, is um, intentional or out of band emissions that come into the band that the sensor is designed to receive in. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm focusing on the um, uh, passive band uh, or the passive receivers and out of band emissions, non intentional emissions immediately outside the band. Uh, that the uh, sensor is operating in. Um, that is where energy, because it's uh, modulated, actually doesn't stop right at the edges. That energy comes in and there is it into that band and that causes uh, the sensor to receive more energy than it's expected. Now, as you remember in the last slide, I mentioned that uh, the, the, um, the energy that is being observed is extremely weak. So one of the problems we have is that it doesn't take much energy at all for um, for the sensor to be um, interfered with. So, uh, bottom line with these type of interferences, that uh, this uh, measurement can be data loss, data corruption, increased radiometric noise, and um, and even uh, uh, wrong retrievals of the geophysical parameters. So. When we get into uh, remote sensing in the RF passive bands, uh, one of the things, one of my favorite words here is uh, anthropogenic passive band sensors really cannot discern between what is natural spectrum emissions from the earth that I was talking about earlier and anthropogenic uh, generated spectrum emissions. So if you, if you think about it in terms of, of uh, Gaussian noise, you have natural Gaussian noise coming up from the earth, and you also have what I'll call quasi-Gaussian noise coming up from the earth that is uh, from anthropogenic uh, or man-made sources. So um, we've got uh, in the United States, the FCC has, has uh, recognized that passive sensors are not able to differentiate between natural and man-made sources of, uh, of these signals and that uh, it can be an impact to weather models, forecasting accuracy, uh, and so forth. One of the problems we have, and we'll get into more detail here, but um, is that uh, it's really difficult to actually see uh, the interference uh, that is, is generated. It's not, as most of us tend to think of, of uh, radio frequency interference uh, with, with a strong signal. So let me just kind of show you real quick what I mean here. Um, if we were to talk about, and I'll, I'll use 5G, that's uh, a most current uh, source of, of um, almost global uh, uh, emissions uh, as it's being implemented around the world. Um, so if you had an interference uh, to a passive band sensor and, and you were trying to discern if you were actually having interference, what would it be like? What would it look like? And this is our typical way of thinking about interference. You've got a signal and you're trying to measure the noise level that's coming in. You're looking for natural noise and there's this uh, interfering signal that comes in. But this is actually not the way it looks uh, for, for interference uh, in, in the situation that I'm talking about. It's actually, it looks a little bit more like this. You have interference, but it's part of the noise as much as the measured data is. You can't see the difference. And so that becomes the problem where we can be fooled. The sensor can be fooled. So um, the presence of radio frequency interference in several instruments has been documented. Uh, here's a couple of, of examples. Um, Aquarius uh, in L-band. Uh, AMSR2 at, at 10 gigahertz, uh, WinSat, uh, Sentinel-1, and so forth, we've been starting to map out and look at where sources of interference are occurring and trying to start uh, um, adding that degree of robustness as we can, uh, or trying to at least uh, identify where interference is and know that, uh, that it's tracked and, and uh, could be degrading uh, the data that we are uh, attempting to collect. So let's go to, there we go, as to why is this a problem for microwave sounders? And, and I'm 
creating a mythical scenario here. Um, but basically, a, a good way to view this is that if we had a 230 Kelvin environmental signal and we had five Kelvin of RFI signal also, the sensor would read and measure this as 235 Kelvin, basically 230 plus five, and you've got 235. Um, or if you had 235 Kelvin of environmental signal and no interference, zero Kelvin, it would still be measured at 235. They're indistinguishable between the two sensors. So where we run into a problem is, is that the anthropogenic uh, interference could be there and, and corrupting the data that's being measured. Um, so if we have a, you know, a, a source such as uh, 5G, um, and it uh, happens to be only providing that much of, of, uh, of interference in, in an adjacent band interference situation, that's how we would start to see a problem that could be um, uh, corrupting the data that's being measured. So I'm gonna just uh, step right really quick through this idea um, in three levels. So the first is, is that we have very little energy coming up anthropogenically and it's undetectable. Basically, it's below the sensitivity of our instruments and, uh, and then we can say it was undetectable and not a concern. The problem we have with undetectable is not present day, but the fact that as since uh, what is undetectable 10 years ago can be detected today, and what is undetectable today may be easily detectable 10 years from today. So you have to consider that this is a dynamic environment. Um, the next, uh, or I should say the, 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 the most obvious one, obvious contamination, is where we get enough energy, anthropogenic energy, that it's obviously wrong and we can throw the data out. It's a problem, we know it's a problem, but the problem is, is, is that we now have no data from that area. We had obvious contamination, we threw the contaminated data away, but now we have nothing left. And so we are not getting a measurement in that area due to the contamination. That's the obvious contamination one. And we've lived with that, uh, as you saw earlier, um, for, for, for a long time and we, we work with that. The one that uh, is of greatest concern, um, and not to say that obvious contamination is not uh, of concern, it is, but of even more concern is insidious contamination. And that's where we don't know that we're being contaminated. Um, so that one um, is, is very dangerous to us. Uh, the corrupting data or the signal, the energy that we're getting that's anthropogenic in nature, is actually coming to us by way of, of uh, uh, such a small amount that it's just corrupting the data. We just don't know that that's there. Um, basically, what all this leads to is, you know, a need for adding robustness to our systems. Uh, this problem has been growing as the use of uh, in the development of technology and the deployment of it, and um, and as that has happened we have seen uh, what was originally a rather, um, uh, what I'll call a, a rather understood environment to a lot more dynamic today than it has been in years past. So let's get into um, the speed of, of how fast this can happen. Um, you know, SMOS uh, data corruption, this is going back to, to measurements in Japan made uh, about, uh, um, Oh, roughly a, about 10 years ago or so, um, they introduced uh, low noise block converters. Um, and as they started to do this, um, the interference, they leaked and you could see this deployment. It happened very fast within less than 18 days. Uh, and, and, and some some have identified it as, as uh, because these things were already deployed to everybody's home. Uh, once they turned on this particular um, uh, TV receiver, uh, it, it was almost uh, within a day uh, you started to see this difference. But less than 18 days, you can see how fast this happens. Um, now, that's, that's in the commercial world. When you start looking at satellites and space systems, it's a lot slower. This is a... Um, 
you know, a, a, what I call a vastly different timeline um, between commercial broadband development and uh, uh, meteorological satellites. Um, if you look at uh, in the U.S., they have uh, um, the GOES R series satellites, which uh, basically started back around uh, 1997, 98, roughly, where they started doing the development. Um, from the time that it started to do the development and, and lock in its design to when it was actually launched, you're, you're looking at uh, the, the same, in that same time, uh, um, you're looking at going from, in terms of uh, advanced wireless services, from 2G to 5G. That much change has happened just from the time you started to build a new meteorological satellite to when it was launched uh, for the, the lower, and that's the geosynchronous. Um, uh, for the, a, uh, the joint polar satellite uh, system, uh, JPSS, um, it started. And um, from the time that uh, when it first started as INPOS to when it was launched as JPSS-1, we had gone from 2G and uh, we're literally looking at probably by the time before we have finished launching these four satellites, uh, which the last one will launch in around 2030, We'll have be we'll be in 6G by that point. So vastly different uh, uh, changes in terms of the how slow it takes for us to get complex large satellites into orbit versus uh, deployment of um, uh, of, of uh, terrestrial systems, advanced wireless systems. So let's take a look at some other sources. I've been using 5G an awful lot and um, and advanced wireless services, but. It's not the only thing um, that can be a source of contamination to, uh, to microwave sounders and other passive uh, sensors. Um, the the um, non-geosynchronous uh, commercial mega constellations, uh, Starlink and so forth, um, they're, they're looking to be um, able to, to move their data and they need the high data rates um, in, in and around the 50.2 to 50.4 gigahertz passive band. That little piece of, of, of spectrum is, is set aside for um, passive sensing, and it's a very important band for that. Um, but there's a lot of users that are, are trying to, to um, establish um, use of the bands directly adjacent to 50.2 to 50.4. So we have uh, uh, in, the, in the World Radio Communications uh, Agenda for 2027, uh, we have quite a few what we call agenda items, and these are um, specific areas of, of study and focus for discussion that will be uh, looked at for the international radio regulations uh, that potentially will be implemented in 2027 um, for, uh, um, that will affect uh, use of 50 gigahertz, uh, who would use it, how they would use it, and so forth. And, uh, and then you have additional agenda items that uh, would also affect use of the passive bands below and above 50 gigahertz. So um, there's a lot of use, there's a lot of need for spectrum and, uh, and protecting spectrum is uh, from interference in our passive band is one of the uh, uh, challenges that we're facing. And the reason why we're looking towards the idea of how do we build a standard? What should the standard look like? And, uh, and, and have it implemented so that uh, in the future, these passive band sensors are more robust. Um, so the next question is, is okay, so you, you figure out how to find it. How do you differentiate between quasi-Gaussian um, and Gaussian uh, noise? If you're able to do that, what can we do? Um, well, the first part of it is that if we can identify the data that is corrupted, we could actually flag it and throw it away or de-weight it and, uh, and, and use that uh, uh, data with the appropriate caution that we should. Uh, we can map areas of contamination like you hear with, uh, um, uh, with Africa, uh, measure the, the um, amount of energy that's coming uh, from anthropogenic sources and, and map it. Uh, so you can actually know where, when you're doing measurements, you're likely to experience some contamination. Um, you could learn to use higher frequencies. However, these higher frequencies don't have the same performance 
we would have to make a lot of adjustments to do that. Um, and, um, you know, we can constantly assess and modify product development uh, to make maximum use of our data. So that's knowing the environment, uh, knowing what's being deployed and being aware of it and characterizing it. So let's get into what I've talked about all along, which is the standard and how we're going to go about uh, developing this. So what is the purpose? Well, we've been talking about that. Um, the purpose of a standard is an engineering principle and it's the first step for controlling uh, any malleable parameter to acquire the capacity to measure that parameter accurately. Um, so we're going to dig into uh, uh, this RFI to remote sensors and, uh, and the impact to remote sensing and applications due to RFI and basically design a standard that will, if adhered to, make our passive and active sensors more robust and more um, resilient for um, uh, this increased use of spectrum in and around um, the passive bands and the active uh, sensing bands as appropriate. So what is the scope of this standard? You can see that uh, we'll define a methodology to quantitatively evaluate the amount of man-made or anthropogenic radio frequency interference in any given frequency band allocated to space-based remote sensing. So that is, um, that is gonna be the scope. It'll be useful in understanding the situation of all the bands allocated to remote sensing and to follow their trends and defining priorities for our spectrum managers so that they uh, can also look at this from a regulatory perspective as well as an operational one. So let's go to uh, the process of, uh, of building an IEEE standard. Um, this, uh, this particular uh, uh, group, P4006, um, started their first meeting back in uh, June of 2021. And uh, with hopes of completing the standard development uh, sometime around mid-2025, and if you look here at this process, you, you, you go through the, the, uh, the circle with initiating, mobilizing, drafting, balloting, gaining final approval, and then maintaining. Um, and that is the, the classic work on uh, developing the standard. So let's take a, a look at the potential flow uh, with respect to our standard that we're talking about here. Um, so the potential flow is, is we're looking at RFI detection. How do we actually start to, to find this? Because as, as I said earlier, you have uh, quasi-Gaussian. It's, it's not easy for you to actually pull up. So you're gonna have to have detection techniques and implementation procedures uh, once you have detected it. Um, other custom RFI detection procedures. Basically, um, do you have false alarm rates? Uh, you know, so you maintain quality. What you're trying to do is, is balance the idea of keeping corrupting uh, anthropogenic energy, uh, identifying it and dealing with it, but not accidentally eliminating good data. So how do you differentiate that and ensure that your um, uh, filters are appropriate and that your RFI detection is working correctly? Um, and then uh, if you are able to detect it, then you should actually start to identify the area that it is occurring in and basically say, okay, RFI maps in a sensor reference frame, you're starting to look at, okay, I saw this over, let's just say London. And, um, and, and so I'm going to map that London at this frequency on this, at this time uh, is a source of uh, anthropogenic uh, corruption. So then the next thing is uh, maybe these maps will be in a global reference frame so that uh, other users can actually make use of it as well. Uh, you want to be able to, to make uh, um, uh, this, um, these maps in a way that they become commonly used as opposed to uniquely used. This way, uh, the data is consistent and is consistently uh, shared. And then finally, you have uh, RFI characterization where the RFI properties catalog so that uh, it will assist in uh, for others to actually be able to make uh, RFI detection even more um, robust, uh, actually even more accurate. So 
with that, uh, let's kind of step into a little bit more detail on, on this RFI detection. Um, so the sensors have their own bandwidth coverage, observing periods, and so forth. Each one is, is some, has a certain unique aspect to it. Um, RFI detection techniques and implementation procedures are sensor dependent. Uh, you typically have to uh, uh, design your, your abilities around the nature of, of your sensor. Um, if, the, the, uh, uh, if you're looking at these two sensors here, uh, sensor A and sensor B, uh, if your uh, potential source of interference is, is such that it is, um, uh, the sensitivity of sensor B is such that it doesn't pick up on the RFI, and, and the RFI source is actually a, in, in a frequency that sensor A, the far more sensitive sensor, uh, which would have been affected by it, doesn't overlap, then you have no, no real problem, but you would, um, uh, or at least you would not have any real interference, but you would have to, to watch for false alarm rate um, and, and quality control, basically, uh, to ensure that your RFI is, is um, uh, not being reported when it really is not happening. So the opposite of this though can occur. And that is, is where you start looking at uh, the RFI is, is actually over where uh, sensor A um, would see it. Uh, sensor B, and my graphic got stretched a little bit here, but if sensor B uh, still does not see it, it would report that there is nothing there. Um, but sensor A, seeing that RFI, which is, is uh, uh, overlapping, um, its uh, level of sensitivity would actually have received something. So again, uh, you'd want to, to report that there's RFI, map it, and so forth, but you have to have enough characterizations in this process so that sensor B, which is, as we said earlier, less sensitive, um, is, is uh, not now throwing out data that it doesn't need to. Um, so these are factors that go into developing this the standard uh, that we have to consider. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about step two with these RFI maps. Um, you basically have uh, uh, the, the data collected. It goes into a database, but it, it, it also becomes something that you can observe. Here is kind of a, 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 a little bit of a, a mapped picture of, of the sources of interference as, as it's going over um, the United States and Canada, and, uh, and it starts getting mapped out and says, okay, when I was uh, in this area looking at this thing, I observed interference. Um, so there's this basic data that you see, the when, the where, which band, which, in other words, your, your frequency, how strong was it? Um, and that all leads to, to data that can then be used by other sensors to help avoid uh, uh, corruption of their data. Um, looking at this where it becomes uh, blended, uh, you start being able to put uh, these different uses together. You can see here, um, GRSS has uh, um, an RFI observations display uh, system. It's a kind of a global RFI map that can actually be uh, displayed um, and, and looked at. Um, it's uh, um, still a little bit difficult to maintain um, it's not, uh, uh, with, you know, but ultimately it becomes uh, a, a great way for you to actually see if there's interference and if that is happening with others as well. And you can actually start to, to uh, be able to factor that in as you're looking at uh, surveillance of uh, uh, various environmental phenomena. Um, so uh, you could actually also, when you're starting to look at this, factor this in for future satellite uh, design and missions. So, um, let's see. There we go. I had a mouse problem here. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's go on to RFI characterization. And, um, and so you actually, in this step, you're basically uh, capturing the, the RFI properties cataloging it, uh, what kind of source exists where, how does it affect. It may be um, um, 
one where uh, the RFI uh, is is uh, legal uh, is legal, uh, in which case then you have to figure out how you can live with it. And by legal, I mean it complies with the radio regulations. Uh, but if it does not comply with the radio regulations, then it should be reported that you are um, that you are having interference and um, and and that uh, there is a source of interference that needs to be identified and. Um, and, and stopped uh, in terms of its uh, uh, impact to, to uh, legal users of that band. So, um, so the P4006 uh, group is, is, um, has started developing the standards, has, is actually in the midst of it and working uh, um, uh, quite uh, um, earnestly towards uh, uh, getting a standard that uh, hopefully by uh, mid-2025 will actually be out um, and, and usable. And I think it uh, is, is, is a very important step towards um, acknowledging that the spectrum environment is increasingly uh, complex. Um, every year, there's more uh, technologies that depend on it. Um, you can't put anything in space without depending on, on spectrum if you wanna use a satellite. You're, you're looking at the satellite has to have uh, access to spectrum, has access to, to gravity, and then you've got a satellite. But if you don't have that, you're, you're not going to be uh, uh, gathering data. You're not going to be communicating. The satellite is just a rock and gone. So you need to, to have access to spectrum. And, uh, and most every new technology now is, is demanding access to spectrum as well. So in, in dealing with this, we have to expect that the uh, environment, the, the um, radio frequency spectrum environment is increasingly complex year after year. Um, so that in mind, we need to have a good standard, uh, standard that uh, designers can, can uh, access and make use of uh, so that um, when you start assessing this interference and this potential for interference to um, uh, to satellite uh, passive band sensors, as well as active band sensors, you need to um, uh, have something so that you can be more robust and be less sensitive to this uh, adjacent band interference as well as, as in band interference, should that also occur. Um, so uh, I want to ask uh, for those who are able to um, and would like to contribute, We'd love to have uh, more folks as part of the, the standards group, uh, P1006, um, and basically the RFI and remote sensing working group. So uh, open to anybody, and I want to thank you all very much for your time uh, on this and appreciate uh, your attention. I'll open up the floor to questions. Um, so again, thank you. Thank you very much, Bo, for this very interesting talk. Now let's, as you said, let's open the floor for discussion. I see some questions already coming in. So let's start. The first uh, one is from Feishan Huang, which asks is um, if the standard will cover anything related to RFI mitigation methods. Um, the standard is 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 a good question. Uh, the standard is focused on on um, uh, RF mitigation standards towards passive and active sensors. Um, it is focused on on the uh, bands that uh, relate to it, but it is truly focused on on uh, space systems interacting with the uh, electromagnetic environment. Okay, we have another question from John Wethrin. Sorry if I did not pronounce correctly. Um, it says that some groups may want to intentionally interfere with systems. Open availability of RFI reports would allow these groups to test and validate their interfering process. Is this a concern? Is there a way of mitigate this? Well, there's there's always bad actors. And, uh, and if you have standards, um, yes, there, there are groups that could, uh, to do this, um, more, more likely there's easier ways to, to actually, um, uh, do ways, um, 
there's actually easier ways that they can disrupt um, rather than understanding what the standards are and then and then corrupting or or um, uh, attacking through those uh, standards. So I don't see the standard itself as being a, um, a vulnerability to space systems. Um, I think. Uh, the the uh, um, there's there's a lot of other specifications in space systems that are far more easily um, uh, used in that particular approach. So I'd say the answer is is really no. Um, I don't see that the standards themselves would be a, a source of vulnerability. Okay. Another question from Tim Hewinson. Do the uh, working group covered the mechanism to report illegal sources of RFI? Um, do the, I'm, I'm sorry, repeat the question, RFI? Yes, the question is if uh, the, the standard would co cover the mechanism to report illegal sources of RFI. Ah, yes. So the standard um, uh, itself would not uh, be the source of, of um, the process for reporting illegal use of, of the of the spectrum. Um, that's actually done through um, through administrations um, directly into the ITU uh, is 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 one approach that's pretty typical, and that is is that uh, uh, as it's noticed um, uh, the um, system that is being interfered with would report that to their administration. The administration would then file that data into uh, what's called CIRRUS, which is the um, uh, database for, for interference at the ITU. Um, that process would not be part of the standard. The standard would simply identify that, uh, you know, if you are experiencing interference, um, that this process, that you should engage with the administration. Okay, but a lot of questions. So another one from Arvind Aradia. Uh, the question is, with respect to the current flow and numerical weather prediction, is it accurate to say that degradation of observation, especially over some, but not all regions, degrades the precision for measurements globally? Yeah, uh, yes. I would say that uh, even though you have um, degradation uh, that can occur in, in one region of the globe, and not in another, ultimately all numerical weather prediction and such is based on data that is global in nature. So if you're, you're, you're affecting one area and not another, um, it's still, there is an effect globally uh, as a result of, of that. Yeah, good question. Okay, um, another, another one from Sanjay. Is there P-band allocated for standards in remote sensing for soil moisture sat satellite in future? Um, could you repeat the question? Because I think I, yes, I... it is about if P-band is will be allocated or uh, monitored by this standard. Ah. The use of P-band in for the remote sensing of soil moisture. Yeah, I think um, you'd actually have to look at the the. Um... Uh, radio regulations uh, with respect to to the specific bands that are allocated for, and so there are very specific bands or frequencies that are established for for passive band and active uh, uh, um, band use uh, or or active sensors. So passive sensor band um, has very specifically, and it, and it's um, pretty much through most uh, areas of the. Um, of, of what we have the controlled or, or the regulated electromagnetic spectrum between, um, uh, um, let's just say all the way down below L band and all the way up into uh, the, in fact, uh, 200 or so gigahertz um, are identified for passive bands, uh, just segments within them, they're clearly identified. And, uh, and if you wanna look more closely, uh, I'd refer you to the ITU uh, website for that. Uh, to get the exact bands that you're interested. Okay, another question from uh, Tim Hewison. Uh, you suggested that what is undetect undetectable now may be detectable in 10 years. Would you agree that technology is sufficiently mature and microwave and millimeter wavelengths such as that receive receiver noise developments have largely stabilized, except maybe for some millimeter wave and polarimetric sensors? 
I, I don't know. Yes, I think that uh, there, there's there is a degree of maturity in in uh, the systems that we have, um, uh, the microwave systems today. But I would hesitate to say that um, uh, that uh, that's it. Uh, I think that um, uh, there are continuous uh, um, uh, efforts, technological efforts to increase sensitivity in, in a variety of different ways. And I would I would hesitate to say that uh, that we're stabilizing in that regard, uh, or I should say that we're done. It uh, definitely uh, um, has future possibilities, and I would say that uh, you you should never really think of anything as being static. Um, in all the years that I've been doing uh, and working with the spectrum environment, um, uh, we're constantly seeing improvements or changes. So. You should always be careful when you think that you've reached a, a stable plateau. And uh, in, in this particular case, um, I hesitate to say that what is undetectable today will remain undetectable. Thank okay. you. Another one from Brianzu wrote, how can we establish standards to mitigate RFI in a spaceborne microwave remote sensing for accurate weather and climate monitoring? Mm. Um, so, so if I understand the, the question right, is looking at ways of mitigation. Uh, yes. And so if I, um, so, so there's a variety of different ways to mitigate. Um, and, and, uh, and in fact, that's one of the, the challenges in developing the standard that uh, we're working with. Um, if you start thinking about uh, uh, RFI mitigation, um, uh, the first one is is try to eliminate the interference from uh, occurring. So the first step that has been taken um, has been uh, work by in the international community uh, to to establish standard or I shouldn't say standards uh, regulations uh, that uh, define how steep that roll off should be, and 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 try to protect uh, uh, adjacent band interference from uh, becoming a source of anthropogenic energy within the passive band. The problem is, is that um, demand is so strong, you really can't just uh, um, ignore a possible use of, of spectrum. So that pushes the, 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 the um, desire uh, to have more access to spectrum closer and closer to those band edges. And, um, and so, you can't really say that uh, that that mitigation is perfect by any means. So you end up with the next problem, which is okay. So there might be anthropogenic energy inside the passive band, and now what do you do? Well, then you look at well, can I filter it? Can I identify when I see it? Can I um, can I develop uh, ways of uh, if I do experience it of flagging it so that uh, should I see interference or should, should there be uh, corruption of my data? That, that that corruption is identified and removed or, or, or flagged so that I'm aware of it. Uh, that's important because the data that comes down from meteorological sensors are, is typically shared with many different administrations and is used in, in these different administrations uh, modules. So, uh, so the mitigation techniques for, for um, avoiding an interference are important to play in that role as well. Uh, so if you can't uh, stop it from its source, then you got to figure out how to deal with it uh, from your own system, and and so then that's that's the approach I would take, and I think uh, in the standard is is investigating that um, in in terms of it developing the standard. Thanks. Okay, another question from uh, David Luber. Uh, those I believe have any mechanism to create and perhaps fund a competition for academic development of a small sat RFI detection systems in these millimeter wave bands? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we'd have to increase our dues, I suppose, <laughs> to have a good funded uh, competition for, for the amount of uh, work that would have to go into it. But um, uh, but I think the challenge is out there. Uh, I think that uh, this is something that uh, may be commercially viable, is, is becoming a, a source of, of mapping uh, RF densities uh, globally and commercially creating that map or that database and maintaining it and making it a, a resource that's available to other 
uh, satellite users. So it may well be that, uh, or space system users and, and people who are uh, monitoring this kind of data. So yeah, it, there, there may be um, uh, uh, an incentive there, but uh, I, I don't think uh, IEEE could, um, well, I, I don't think that they would reach into their pockets for this yet, but it's a good thought. <laughs> Okay, a uh, comment also from David Luber is regarding the disruption. Uh, he points out that this is a much different mechanism than intentional RFI to communication systems because every country in the world requires information characterizing the atmosphere for the purpose of weather forecasting. So intentionally creating RFI for, uh, for Earth observation would affect a global uh, uh, numerical weather prediction model, no matter what was model it might be. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair point. Yeah, no, that's 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 a fair point. Um, and then, and back to the um, uh, you know, it's Earth, the weather on Earth is interrelated. There, there is no geographic uh, separation such that uh, what happens in one part of the Earth doesn't affect other parts. Yeah, very true. Okay, um, a comment from Arvin Aradia. Uh, would you? provide an overview of some of the more promising approaches for RFI excision from data sets. For example, uh, use spectral kurtosis based detection or RFI steranography. That's a tough one. Okay. Ah, so so uh, if if I understand correctly, we're talking about the algorithms and 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 um, and basically for the most part, I think statistical kurtosis is has been the approach that's been most um, uh, most relied upon um, in terms of, of identifying, in fact, trying to separate quasi-Gaussian uh, uh, noise from, from a Gaussian noise. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, but it's a good question, actually, because uh, if you start looking at the various algorithms that, that would be used, um, you, you, you have two kinds, really, that, that should be thought about. One is, is that if you, it's an unknown source of RFI, and, and you don't have the characterization that we talked about earlier in the presentation. If it's an unknown, then you're actually running a variety of algorithms against the, the uh, data that you've received. The, the um, uh, information is, is hard to, to pull out. So you're running a lot of, of algorithms. So it becomes a computationally intensive process as opposed to if it's a known RFI and you're simply looking for uh, for for that uh, um, unique aspect of of, of uh, interference occurring over uh, a variety of locations, you just want to see that it's there or not there, but you already know what you're looking for. Then a very straightforward, say a very you know a define uh, an established statistical uh, kurtosis type algorithm would actually you just run that, and, and it would be much less intensive. So you can basically have. Uh, um, if you have the known uh, sources of uh, anthropogenic energy and you, you have characterized it, then it uh, is much less intensive, far far less uh, energy required, uh, required in order to run that. So, you know, better to have uh, and, and find ways to, to know what the sources are and that way you can look for them much uh, easier than to be trying to search through all your data uh, for the unknowns. Okay. Um, another question from Priyansu wrote, I believe the question is below, it's the following. How can we develop standards to protect passive microwave remote sensing from RFI and ensure data accuracy? With expansion of 5G, what strategies can mitigate its impact on passive sensors? How we can ensure technology like 5G repeaters and IAV do not compromise remote sensing data? Yeah, that, that's... Um... You know, and, and that's that's what we've been grappling with within the um, uh, that's one of the factors that we've been grappling with in establishing a standard. Um, you know, the and if I understand it correctly, one of the the difficulties here is 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 being able to 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 put the uh, I'll just say the knife blade down in the exact spot where uh, on one side is interference and on the other side is the data that you want. Uh, if you don't um, if you don't have um, uh, a really clear idea as to where that line is, um, you you could end up causing a loss of good data. Um, 
and and vice versa and and even worse is is that you could have go the other way and be a little bit too uh, uh, relaxed in in establishing your your um, uh, definitions uh, for what you would allow and you end up uh, um, uh, actually re, uh, introducing corrupted data into your data sets and one thing I didn't really say uh, as we're as we were talking is that this the data that's typically collected in in uh, numerical weather prediction systems is stored and used forever um uh the the data is is actually very important uh not just for the weather over the next 10 days but it's important for for uh for for the weather uh observations that have been taken place and and uh, reviewed and looked at for for identifying trends and long term phenomena and so forth. So, if it's corrupted and it stays, you know, stays in the database, uh, you'll you'll have that corruption forever. Um, so, very important about that too. So, yeah, I think mitigation, uh, um, identification, and ensuring that this uh, uh, standard as it's being implemented uh, is as robust as possible. Okay, uh, questions from Arabin Venkita Subramoni. I understand RFI sources of non-Gaussian nature can be identified by higher order statistics estimates. Are there anthropogenic RFI sources that are Gaussian in nature? Mm. Well, I've been careful to say quasi-Gaussian. Um, one of the things uh, is that, uh, uh, you know, in theory, uh, you could have an anthropogenic source that truly is Gaussian uh, or, or so close to Gaussian that uh, you can't discern it yet. Uh, but if you're looking at normal operations, uh, you're, you're transmitting, uh, uh, let's just use 5G. Uh, so you're transmitting uh, on the earth, you're going from one point to, to another point. Uh, that energy is um, basically... Uh, bounced around and becomes part of a whole collective that be, that starts to to head in in a spaceward direction or or basically that energy is becoming emitting. Um, so what you end up with is is what's kind of it's not a clear signal by any means. It is uh, basically what I would call quasi Gaussian noise, not easily discernible from Gaussian, but um, but it's still uh, by the time. You know, and, and I apologize. Sometimes I, I just, it, it's a mush. <laughs> it comes up and it's, it's just, uh, um, by the time it, it uh, is at the sensor, it's just uh, um, uh, no longer uh, a usable signal by, that, by any means, but it still has the attributes of anthropogenic uh, um, quasi Gaussian noise. Thanks. Okay. Uh, question from Damon Bradley. Thank you both for this extremely important contribution. Damon Bradley from Deep Space Technologies here. In 2025, how do you envision a sensor developer using the standard to design future sensors that incorporate RFI mitigation on board? So a question on the usage of the standard. So, so if the user is, is uh, making use of the standard, uh, the standard should actually provide um, uh, key data that can be factored into the sensor or provide information as to the uh, uh, means by which you should um, 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 design the sensor with the ability to detect or or characterize data um, that you are monitoring. So it would be something along the lines of either you you have a, a, um, a sensor uh, just specifically there to look for and, and tag or flag uh, um, corrupted or potentially corrupted data. Um, and, and that is one aspect. It could also be that uh, it's recommended that the system uh, be designed such that it accesses or makes use of map data uh, and, and knows when and where it's uh, collecting data that could be corrupted uh, and, and can uh, treat it uh, as uh, potentially uh, corrupted data and so forth. So it, it's either um, somebody looking at it from a hardware design capability uh, or it can be a factored into the overall system and be designed into the software. Thanks. Okay. Um, there's another another question from him, from Diamond Bradley. 
do the working group maintain a library of standards, perhaps synthetic RFI signals, such as the research community has a common source to test and validate new algorithm against? If not, do you see this as value added? A similar resource that inspires this idea is the UCI machine learning repository. Hmm. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question. Um, can you repeat it again? Yes, well, he's asking if uh, having a library of, for example, RFI affected signals for the community to test new mitigation or detection algorithms would, uh, if this is exist or this, if this would add value to the to the working group, uh, I guess to the FARS. Yeah. No. Thank you. Thank you. That, um, yeah. If you actually are, are able to build a. Uh, um, a system, and again, this actually may be something that's very commercially viable. Uh, if you're actually able to to establish a library of of um, uh, of, of um, sources or or, or potentially corrupted uh, uh, corrupting anthropogenic energy uh, to test against, um, that actually is is um, that could be a very positive thing um, in in working towards uh, designing your system and ensuring that it is. Uh, uh, robust enough in the environment that it's going to operate in. So, um, yeah, I think that actually would be a, a good thing. It won't necessarily be um, part of the standard in and of itself, but the standard could recommend that uh, uh, simulation and testing be done along this way prior to, to deployment. So, yeah, good point. Yep. Uh, see, questions are still pouring in. So, <laughs> another one. From Arvin Ardia, the, the, the subject is very interesting. Uh, you can see it. Uh, have there been any concerted efforts in exploiting the anthropogenic RFI energy as signals of, of opportunity, for example, in as transmissometry, and taking some lemonade out out, out of these lemons? Uh, interesting point. Yeah, yeah, the good point. Um, yeah, I, I um, you know, to a certain degree. Um, I, I, I agree. Wherever we can can uh, apply leverage uh, and make use of of um, uh, this data, uh, I would I would actually um, uh, encourage that uh, approach. Um, definitely would be a good uh, contribution into to the working group. Um, so I would uh, yeah I would I would I would say yeah making uh, lemonade out of the lemons is 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 good. Okay, uh, these are all the questions from the audience. I have one from myself as well. <laughs> um, just, uh, well, as you mentioned, uh, using these to help uh, spectrum enforcement and uh, spectrum regulation activities is critical. And this means communicating very well and very carefully all the information that the standards compiles. So what's in your opinion, as as uh, an experienced spectrum manager, what's your opinion on how is appropriate to communicate these very sensitive, uh, sometimes results of uh, if your country has a very high level of contamination, how this can be com communicated in an effective way to to, to get the, the most credit out of out of it? Yeah, that's that's um, that's a good question. And gee, we're just out of time. I just. <laughs> I think that what you say is is um, uh, when you start looking at uh, um, being effective with with uh, uh, the interference and and uh, and let's go back to also as as uh, uh, we had a call uh, one of the uh, um, audience members had talked about um, you know how do you deal with bad actors as well and uh, and I think in terms uh, and 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 I kind of see a relationship here in that. Um, it's really one of the aspects of, of uh, where you start to see interference or you're having corrupted data and you, you you recognize that you have corrupted data, which is one of the important parts is, is that you can't report interference if you don't know that you're having interference. Um, but when you do, um, there are um, the every administration or, or almost every, I, I, I won't say that it, it Conclusively, but almost all administrations have spectrum management processes established um, because 
spectrum, uh, the radio frequency spectrum is a national resource. And uh, in every nation, it's a sovereign right uh, within the nation's borders. Um, so if you have uh, um, an interference, you actually um, would follow uh, the appropriate administration. Uh, now with space systems, it gets a little complex because which administration do you really belong to? But uh, um, but if you are having interference and you are subjected to that um, in, in you're losing data, you really need to report it to, to the administrations. And, and you can't just simply report it once and expect that, that um, you know, the, the spectrum police will show up at, at the, the culprit's doorstep. You, you need to stay on it and, and track it, um, the process and that, uh, that the spectrum is being uh, alleviated. Uh, too often, um, people have reported RFI and thought that, okay, now it's in the system and it'll be eliminated, but uh, only to find that, uh, uh, that the process fell through somewhere in, the, in, the, in that. So yes, follow the, uh, the administration's uh, spectrum management requirements. If you have somebody that's violating or illegally using uh, the radio spectrum, it needs to be reported and, uh, and corrected. Almost most every time, uh, not all the time, but most every time, uh, the source of interference is inadvertent. Uh, an amateur radio operator who who mistuned his his particular transmitter, or um, I, I've I've had one experience where it was a vehicle transmitter, and the person was slamming his car door so much that it knocked the frequency off and it started to transmit in in a different way. Um, so. You have to to um, to track that down and and handle it. So it's it's not easy. It's expensive uh, finding uh, sources of interference and and correcting them. Um, but uh, there are resources to do it, and um, uh, and and you do the best you can with with trying to um, alleviate it. But again, some of the best things are if your system is robust enough to not be bothered by it, um, then it becomes a non problem to you. Okay, uh, and I see another question, but I think it was covered before. So uh, please, uh, Prinyanshu wrote, please, could you confirm that this was covered already or do you th do you want to go again with this? If, if, if it's already been covered, I, I think we can hold off. We're actually starting to run into people's, uh, we're, we're a little over time. So yes. Um, okay, so. Uh, okay, this has been copied again. So I guess this means that he wants to, but uh, okay, we can, it's true that we are over time. So uh, yes, a bit of words from the first chair. He wants to comment a bit of act some activities that are uh, on the pipeline. So thank you both for this very interesting uh, webinar. And yeah, thank you for joining today. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, it's been a pleasure. And, and again, thank you all very much for the opportunity to, to discuss this very important topic with you. And remember, if, uh, if you actually have uh, um, a chance and you want to contribute, please reach out and be a part of it. Uh, Roger Olivier, um, uh, contact the chair of, of the group um, and, uh, and, and be a part of this. And, and help us with making this the, the, the standard it needs to be. Thanks. Uh, thank you both for this uh, excellent webinar and Raul for uh, moderating it uh, and all uh, the participants who ask questions and listen to it. Um, and I'd like to also make an announcement. Uh, so as uh, many of you know, um, in a couple of weeks, uh, we are going to have um, the IGEFS conference in Athens, and there will be um, some uh, technical sessions and other activities related to um, uh, our technical community, obviously, and the radio frequency interference and these topics. So. Uh, specifically, we have um, 
three technical sessions on Tuesday and uh, the uh, annual meeting of the technical community on Monday evening. Everybody is uh, welcome to attend. So if you are coming to Athens for IGEFTS, we would like to see you there. And um, we'll be there in person. So uh, you can, uh, it'll be a great opportunity to meet. Okay, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all very much.